four Beatitudes, which have to focus us on our relationship with God. And now we'll look at the last four Beatitudes. Which have to do with our relationship with others. The first is for us to be merciful. God is merciful and he wants us to be that way too. In Lamentations 3, it starts off by saying in verse 22, uh, Lamentations. Saying the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. And in James chapter 5, verse 11, it talks about Job learning about God's mercy. So, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. When I was a little boy, there were a lot of toys that I wanted growing up. But I was in a park one day and saw a man with a boomerang. He would throw it out and it would come back. And he would catch it. That was so cool. And he would throw it out and catch it. So I told my parents, I have to have a boomerang. So they bought me one. And I went to the park. And I threw it out. It didn't come back. I had to go fetch it. And sometimes it would go out and come back and hit me. But a boomerang is meant to go out and come back. I call this the boomerang beatitude. You show mercy and you get mercy. You put it out and, and it comes and it comes back. What does it mean to be merciful? It means to, it's more than sympathy, it's the ability to get inside the other person's skin. It means to walk around in their shoes. To see somebody in need and really feel what they're going through. Because when we do that, we really understand the pain that they're under. And we'll be likely to do something about it. In Hosea 6.6, 6, it says that 
God desires mercy, not sacrifice. And, In Micah chapter 6, verse 8, you can read this one. It talks about God wanting us to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly. We know what it is, but also we have some great examples in the Bible of mercy. One is the story of the Good Samaritan. A man was jumped by robbers. He was beat up and left for dead. A priest came by and saw him, but went around on the other side. A teacher came by and also went around on the other side. And then came along a Samaritan. Someone who was the least likely to want to help someone like that man. But he took care of his wounds. He put him on his donkey. He took him to an inn. And he even said, I'll take care of him and when I come back, I'll pay you whatever I need to pay you. And so Jesus said, which of these men were the neighbor? And the expert in law said, the one who showed mercy. Uh, the teacher of the law. The expert in law. So Jesus was telling this story to teach us about mercy. The good Samaritan saw a need and did something about it. We show mercy when we see someone that has a need and we help them out. Sometimes it can be a poor or injured person. Sometimes it may be a member of the church family that is hurt. Maybe not physically, but emotionally. Also, Jesus tells a, a description of the end of time. He says that, that a man will be separated as sheep and goats. And Jesus will say, whenever I was hungry, you fed me. Whenever I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. Whenever I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to see me. When there was a need, you took care of it. So he tells the sheep, come away with me. And they said, when did we see you like this? And Jesus said, whenever you did something for someone else, you were doing it to me. And to the goats, he said, you didn't do that. You will be punished. 
Jesus is talking about the people who show mercy. Are those who don't show mercy. And the father and the prodigal son, the father showed mercy to the son and took him back. This in Luke chapter 15, it says, you can just read it off there. Just read it off. It says that the he could have rejected him but he took him back we are also to live mercy how do we do that it's more than words we have to care and get involved in other people's lives. We need to see a need and do something about it. Most of us spend our lives trying to turn what we might call self-caring. Most of us spend our whole lives trying to turn into what we might call other caring, yeah. caring for others. But the more we care and the more involved we become in other people's lives, the more alive we become. God created us to be people who care for others. There's a story in the Bible about uh, a man who owed a great debt. He owed a lot of money. I'm going to read that, that one. Uh, Matt, 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 so there, there was a debt owed and the debt was forgiven, but the person who was forgiven, go ahead. There was a debt owed that person, but he did not want to forgive. And the master said, I've forgiven you, you should forgive him. We've received great mercy from God. And we should be merciful to others. Jesus also taught the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. So they neglected mercy. And in Mark chapter 
5 and James chapter 2, he shows us that mercy is important and triumphs over judgment. You can say that. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 31, Jeigu kas turi dovana ranginti, tai buvo ranina. Jeigu kas turi dovana duoti, tai buvo duoda dosniai. Jeigu kas turi dovana vadovauti, tai buvo vadovauja poliai. Ir jei kas turi dovana dėlėstikumą, tai parodo jį atsiminti. Ok. And the last one we read is Jude chapter 1, verse 23. Jude. God wants us to walk. To be people like the Good Samaritan. Who sees the need and does something about it. Now Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. For they will see God. What does it mean to be pure in heart? It means to do the right things for the right reasons. It means to be authentic. It means that we understand that our hearts have to change so that they are pure. Many times people are two-faced. They may be one way around Christians. And then they act another way in the world. They're like uh, Mr. Jekyll and Dr. Hyde. There are two different people. Jesus doesn't want us to be that way. He wants us to be one. To be pure in heart means that we're free from being hypocrites. God despises those who claim to serve him but aren't truly living the way they should. The question is, do you wear a mask? Or are you authentic? In Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 5, I'll just represent it. 
He's talking to the Pharisees. And he calls them hypocrites. Because they weren't authentic. And, and then he gives them eight woes. And each of them talks about how that woe to you because you say one thing and you do something else. You appear one way, but you are not that way. Why don't we read verse 15? Now let's read verse 25. They look good on the outside, but not on the inside. So, we're called to remove the mask. To be the real thing. In one way we do that is to ask ourselves a question. What is my motive? Why am I about to do this? If you'll do this, I know that it will help you. If you'll take a three by five card, card, you have three by five cards? Three by five, no card? And write on there what is your motive. And you may want to make several of these. Put one on your mirror. Put someone, one somewhere in your car. Put one on the refrigerator. And when you see it, make yourself think about what you're doing and, and what is your motive. Why are you fixing to tell someone this? Why are you fixing to go to this activity? Why are you fixing to watch this movie? What's your motive? If you ask yourself that, you will be pure in heart if you do what is right. Now he says, blessed are the people. Those, those who make peace. For they will be called children of God. Here's a few verses that tell us about peace. Psalm 34, verse 14. Turn from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. In Romans chapter 12, verse 18. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. In James 3:18, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness.
And in Romans 14, verse 19, make every effort to lead, to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Okay. And then 2 Corinthians 13, 11, they are encouraged to live in peace. In Galatians 5, 22, one of the fruits of the Spirit is peace. In Ephesians 4, 3, we're to make every effort to keep the unity of, uh, unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. In Hebrews 12, 14, we're to make every effort to live in peace. And in, okay. in Mark 9, 50 and 1 Peter 3, 1, it also tells us to pursue peace. God, God wants us to be at peace. That's a lot of verses showing us the importance of peace. A peacemaker first has to be at peace with themselves. Not agitated, ill-tempered, in turmoil. Non-abrasive. If I'm going to help someone or people be at peace, I have to be a person that's peaceful. We live in a world full of people who have a lot of anxiety and worry. We have a lot of people who are angry. They're mad all the time. In anger, the feeling of anger is not wrong or right. It's what you do with that anger that makes it wrong or right. Sometimes there's just all kinds of pressure coming in on us as people. And it's hard, and it's hard to find peace. We settle problems with other people whenever we are able to be accepting and tolerant and positive with the people we're working with. Uh, accepting, tolerant, and, and positive with the people we're working with. Being at peace has to do with reconciliation. God puts a very, uh, uh, places a lot of importance on this, both between us and Him and us with others. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, 
It talks about us going to worship God. And if we know that something's wrong, we need to leave our gift and go make things right. If I know that my brother or sister has a problem with me, I need to fix that as fast as I can. Also, uh, in Matthew 18, it says if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. Yeah, you can go ahead. If someone is in sin, they're not in peace. And we have to do all we can to bring them back to a right relationship with God. And it would be very difficult to tell someone you can no longer be a part of us. But we see that God is serious about making sure people are at peace in their relationship with Him. So we are to make sure that we restore others that are in need of a right relationship with God. Jesus prayed that we would be one. He says, as I am in you, and you are in me. So the world will know that you sent me. When we are unified as a body, we send a message to the world. That Jesus is his son. We have conflicts in life. Conflicts with our children. Conflicts with our employer. Conflicts with our spouse. Conflicts sometimes with people in the church. Paul and Barnabas had a conflict. And they had to figure out a way to resolve it. And they left in peace. And did other did did good things for God after that. And the key to dealing with conflicts is communication. God gives us God gives us the tools and we have to make an effort to resolve things. In any relationship when conflicts go unresolved it's like a wedge gets in that relationship. And if it's not resolved later on, that wedge will cause a crack. It will be destructive later. It's important to resolve those conflicts. Sometimes people get married. They have unresolved conflicts. 
Ten years later, they're sitting in my office. Yes, I think in my office. And their marriage is all falling apart. And sometimes it goes back to some of those unresolved matters. The same thing is true of the church. Sometimes we don't resolve things and later on things fall apart. And that's why. We have to love each other. Encourage each other. Solomon shows us uh, uh, some wise actions for peacemakers. He says they build up. They control their tongue. And they're slow to anger. And they're humble and trusting. That's a peacemaker. Disciples are to always pursue peace. Many years ago, an elder was speaking to uh, those of us who were going to be preachers. He had, been an el- he had been a missionary in Italy. He had been stoned and put in prison as a preacher in Italy. And he said the most dangerous thing was not being beaten because I was a preacher. And he says what's really dangerous for the church. And he told a story. There were two women in the church. They shared a courtyard. They lived in different apartments. And they would hang their clothes in this courtyard. And they didn't have a lot of money. And so they, all the things they had, they were very protective of. And one of the women accused the other woman of stealing her clothes pins. They started a big argument. And eventually the church split. And the Christians met in two different places. Because they didn't resolve the conflict. And the church didn't try to make them resolve the conflict. And so he gave each of us a little rock. And it had a little plastic Barbie type clothespin. And written on it was unity of peace. Sometimes silly things can cause big problems. And finally, we have blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. For they will be called children of God. We're supposed to stand up for Jesus. We have to obey God rather than man. And if we stand up for Jesus, there are times where people will not like it. We know from Acts chapter 8 verse 1 that in the early days the church went through great persecution. 
Mes žinome iš paštavų darbų aštuntos skyriaus, kad stvoji bažnyčia ėjo per tokį periodą, kad kuris buvo labai sunkus pavojingas bažnyčiai. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 it says that everyone who lives a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's not if it's when. In 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 21, it talks about the suffering of Jesus and how we need to follow in his steps. Yeah, yeah. This was the very first, uh, verse 21 was the very first verse I ever memorized. And it talks about Jesus who was perfect, not uh, retaliating against those who mistreated him. But it says he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. I like that because what it says is that Jesus let God take care of the injustices. And when we're mistreated, we don't have to retaliate. We don't have to try to get even. We need to let God take care of it. Once we start getting in the mindset of revenge, we will make ourselves miserable. We need to let it go and give it to God. And we have a promise that he will take care of things. His way and his time. We just have to trust him. There's a lot of examples in the Bible of persecution, but Daniel is one of my favorites. He was so good, they looked into his life. And they could find nothing wrong. So they had to have a plan to, to make him guilty. They had a decree signed that you could not pray. They knew Daniel prayed often. Three times a day he would pray. Open his windows and pray. So they caught him praying. They brought him to the king. They said he has broken the law. He deserves a penalty. So they throw him in the lion's den. That's persecution. But God was with him. And he survived. We're going to face persecution, but we have to stand up against 
ungodly people. We have to have a spirit that says, no matter what men do to me, I'm going to do what God wants in any way. Jesus said, don't be afraid of man who can hurt the body or kill the body. But be afraid of God who can kill both the body and the soul. When I was growing up, there was a song that was sung that, for some reason, as a kid, I memorized. I think it captures the attitude we should have as people who could be persecuted. And I think we have to practice this so that whatever comes in the future will have that kind of spirit. In any country on earth, a few things could happen and we could lose the freedom we have to worship God. And we could be persecuted greatly. I did some uh, work on a, in the Caribbean on an island. And we take people down to the water in the Caribbean to be baptized. People would throw rocks at them as they were going to the water. Because they, because they were becoming Christians. So we'll kind of close our session with this song. Run if you're going to, run if you will. But I came here to stay. When I fall down, I have to get up. Because I, did, because I didn't start out that way. It's a battlefield, brother. It's a battlefield. Warfield. It's a fight and not a game. Run if you're going to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. The decree was signed by the hand of the king. But Daniel used to talk to the Lord. Hungry lions roam the den. Here come dinner, one Lord. Here come dinner. One dinner. One Lord. The lion Lord. Uh, Daniel said, if you're thinking about me, boys, you better forget it. Because I came here to stay. The boys wouldn't bow, so the king got mad. Uh, he said, "He said, turn that furnace up high. Furnace. Furnace. <coughs> Bind them up and throw them in. Those Hebrew boys are going to cry. 
But if you've been around just a little bit later, you might have heard Shadrach say, pull up the chair, you're warm your hands, because we came here to stay. It's a battlefield. Not a recreation room. And so we need to stand here to stay. Thanks.